Next, we have Dr. Sheehan talking about open surgical management. Have a seat, Wes. Good morning. How you doing? Looking good. So it has uh, recently come to my attention that Dr. Lumsden puts all these talks on YouTube, um, which I was not aware. This was uh, brought to my attention by my 11-year-old nephew, Connor. Um, Connor and my son apparently have some kind of ridiculous Minecraft YouTube channel that gets a lot of views and likes. Uh, so they were making fun of my paltry 65 views <laughs> and my suspicious number of likes, who may or may not have been both me. So I was feeling quite bad about myself, and then I looked at my friend Jason Lee's talk and his uh, 24 views. <laughs> so uh, encouraged, I checked my wife, and unfortunately, she t tripled both of us put together. So uh, this year, I'm hoping I'm going to get this awesome talk on these cutting edge technologies and vascular surgeons from all over the world are going to look at my talk, and my views will skyrocket. And of course, I got um, open repair of AAA. So um, I'm coming for you, Connor. I hope this goes up on YouTube. <laughs> Getting ready to go viral. So here's a fellow who finished his training. Where did this guy train? That guy trained in 2001. That's where he trained. So that's me. Uh, that's when fellowship used to be one year. And uh, we, Boston was a pretty conservative town at that point. So we did a lot of open. Your numbers are not going to look like this. And when we look at fellowship numbers um, across the late 2000s, we see EVARs going up, TVARs going up, but the open cases are just disappearing. Um, we were hoping that with the integrated program, maybe over five years, these guys would have better numbers. But the first uh, data from them also pretty paltry. So I'm talking to you today probably about a nearly dead surgery. But it is still important that you know how to do it. So how do we get you to know how to do this? Well, anybody, if any of you ever won the uh, SVS Travel Scholarship, you did this model with me. Um, but the problem with simulation like this is it's real good to learn how to sew the proximal and maybe the steps of the surgery. But it, it's a pretty terrible way to learn how to expose the aorta. The aorta is not a tube sitting in air. It's uh, more like this. So. Cadaver Lab, which I believe we're doing today, is about the only way we can really teach you ex vivo how to do this surgery. So courses like this are very important because you're just not going to finish with a large number of open aneurysms unless you're training in some bizarre place in Louisiana with me. Um, so anyway, where do you find the aneurysms? We'll talk just for a second about screening because it is very important. Um, we did a screening two weeks ago, there's my wife, with, uh, we screened a thousand vets. So if you find the right patient population, you can still find a fair number of aneurysms. And once you find the aneurysms, you have to know what to do with them. And most of the time we're finding three and four centimeter aneurysms. So you watch them, right? We know that aneurysms grow over time. We know that a lot of these will need repair. But we also know that there's really no benefit in repairing them early. So you want to find them, you want to follow them, and then when they ri reach the risk of rupture size, we're going to fix them. So the UK small aneurysm trial showed us what? It showed us that fixing them early, really no survival advantage, but they do grow. And if the patient lives long enough, they'll likely come to repair. And over time, we see that if you screen people, it does have a significant impact on their survival. And over the years, we've seen the risk of uh, mortality from rupture has dropped across the country. And we attribute this to a lot of things. Um, Aneurysm-related death is dropping because of EVAR, because of screening, and because of better techniques. So all of that said, we still have to know how to do it open. So the saccular aneurysms, we generally treat these earlier. But there's no true science behind that. Maybe there's some physics behind it, but it's never really been brought out by any kind of prospective study. We do trend to fix secular aneurysms at a smaller size than 5.5. But just so you know, that's really not based on any pure data. Uh, people with aneurysms tend to have other aneurysms. So once you get a guy or a woman in your, in your lab, you have to check their popliteals. You want to at least make sure they've had some kind of recent chest x-ray so they don't have this giant thoracic aneurysm that you're not um, paying any attention to. All right, so 
As you just learned, all of these indications for open repair can be overcome, but they still are, according to the IFU, indications for open repair. So the problems with the landing zones, problems with thrombus, um, large <laughs> accessory renals, which you can't get to uh, endovascularly, endoleak, persistent endoleak, mycotic aneurysms, and infected stent grafts. So we see a lot of these mainly through uh, our referral center for infected stent grafts, but um, so anybody you're doing open now probably has one or more of these indications. <laughs> so let's say you do have an open aneurysm, we have to do this weird thing, hold the plavix. So that this is the one surgery now where we actually do hold the plavix. Anybody who's been involved in any kind of retroperitoneal bleeding adventures knows that you don't want to be back there uh, with somebody on plavix. So we do hold that. Smoking cessation for as little as two weeks has a survival advantage, believe it or not. You hold the ACE inhibitors the morning of surgery. All these old things we used to have to do as interns that you guys don't really do anymore. But if you are doing an open aneurysm, these you know you still have to remember this. A swan gans catheter, you probably have seen or read about these. Um, if you expect major hemodynamic disturbance, we use them now. We used to use them for everybody, even bypasses. But, um, but now, just really if you expect something untoward to occur. So how do you do your incision? Some people do retroperitoneal, most people do midline. Midline's appropriate for just about every kind of aneurysm um, in the abdomen. Retroperitoneal, kind of an advantage for an inflammatory horseshoe kidney, uh, hostile abdomen, maybe a stoma or uh, severe pulmonary disease, there seems to be some advantage with doing a retroperitoneal incision. Retroperitoneal incision also gives you early return of bowel function, um, but there's really no kind of mortality advantage to either incision. So when we do this, we're gonna clamp the most, or the least disease vessel first. So what that means is usually the iliacs. We're trying to avoid embolization when we clamp. So most people will kind of dissect everything out and then clamp the iliacs first if they're least disease. I was always taught to clamp the aortic neck first, but different people do different things. Um, you wanna sew it right up against the renals. The, one of the biggest causes of recurrence of AAA is, is people who sewed it too far away and you get a recurrence of aneurysm in that neck and that can lead to a nasty pseudoaneurysm and big problems there. Most of these, or about half of them I should say, can be done with a tube graft. The one caveat is if you're doing a rupture and it's a true rupture and even if in the presence of iliac aneurysms, if the iliac aneurysms are not ruptured, you want to just do a tube graft. You have such a poor survival uh, and poor morbidity outcomes with, with ruptures, you want to make it as simple as possible. So if you can get a tube graft and a rupture, be a hero and walk away and you can treat the rest some <laughs> other day. Um, why not just do an aorta by fem, get rid of all of this? The problem is the aorta by fem configuration gives you much higher incidence of infection, wound complications, and pseudoaneurysms. So when possible, you want to stay in the belly. And you want to perfuse at least one hypogastric. That's not only for your bowel circulation, it's also for your pelvic circulation. If you ever get somebody with severe blood claudication, it can be very disabling. So if you perfuse at least one hypogastric, you uh, normally are okay. What's the collaterals to hypogastrics? The other hypogastric? Profunda, good. So the profunda. So if you do have to take both, you want to make sure you look at the profunda, ipsilateral profunda, and make sure that's got a very robust, robust uh, collateral system. All right, so here is an artist's interpretation of what we do. So we lift the transverse mesocolon. Usually before we even put the omni in, I'll have the fellow or resident mobilize the duodenum, kind of get the duodenum up and out of the way before you get your retractors in. And then you're just gonna divide the retroperitoneum right over. You have to take care to avoid the IMA. IMA is usually on the left side of the aorta. So we do it just to the right of that. So there's a couple things with exposure. Um, here we're just incising the retroperitoneum. And it's kind of a box. You see the, the renal vein right on top. The IMV will be to your right or the patient's left. And then the cava is on the other side. So we have this box where the aorta is. And the most important part of the box is the top where the renal vein crosses, because that's our neck and that's our exposure to the renal arteries. So there's a couple different ways to deal with the renal vein. I was taught to ligate it with impunity. Um, if you do that, you kind of avoid a lot of potential trauma to the vein. If you've ever seen the renal vein bleed, you can take my word, it, it bleeds uh, fast, audible, extensively. And um, most of the time, you don't want to be trying to repair the renal vein if you've torn it. So if you are just gonna mobilize it, you need to leave the three collaterals intact. Um, again, veins are not your friend, so the anatomy is always variable. But in general, you have an adrenal vein, the inferior phrenic, and the gonadal vein. So if you leave those intact, you can always ligate it later. 
Some people like to ligate all three, and then they, you could really kind of mobilize that vein. But if you do, you're kind of um, stuck with fixing it if you do tear it. So once you d decide how you're going to deal with the renal vein, you mobilize that, and then you'll have good exposure to the neck. So hopefully, if you're doing it this way, it's either a juxtarenal or uh, infrarenal aneurysm, and you can get exposure there. <clears throat> and then you just open the aneurysm and deal with it anyway. Sometimes if the lumbars are all open, you can get some pretty robust bleeding on opening the sac. Uh, one trick someone taught me is you can take up actually the rubber part of a shot off and just kind of stick those in the lumbars and that'll transiently deal with it and then you can go ahead and sew it so you don't lose a whole lot of blood that way. Um, you're not allowed to leave the shots in. When I heard the trick the first time, I thought, oh, it's cool, I'll just leave them there, they're sterile. And I got in quite a bit of trouble for that. So um, take them out. All right, pop quiz. You clamp the right common iliac artery. Under the clamp, venous bleeding. Profound, audible, coming up at you. What do you do? What do you do? Everybody know? Good, yeah. So as they're trying to demonstrate here, the quickest, easiest way to get to the vein is to transect the artery. So th this artist's interpretation is wrong. Usually the right iliac artery will be crossing the left vein. So you want to divide and transect, control the artery. Most of the time we're going to be sewing to the artery if we're there anyway. So transecting it is no big deal. And then you'll have good exposure of the vein. I, I think on the cadavers we'll be able to show you that this weekend too. When you're done, you just want to close up the, the aneurysm, close up as much tissue as you can between the, the graft and the duodenum so you don't get a fistula later in life. Uh, this is going to be uh, another good talk I'm going to give that'll light up. So you, how to care for your pet dodos, um, and then special considerations: How do you deal with the IMA? Everybody's got kind of different things. Basically, pulse tile ble back bleeding. You probably don't need to reimplant it. No back bleeding. You probably don't, but it's kind of that skittish back bleeding. Most of the time, if if we're in doubt, we'll kind of clamp it, leave it to the side, inspect the bowel later, and if you're in doubt, just just reimplant it. Um, especially when you have concomitant uh, celiac and SMA stenoses. So what about this used to be asked on every board. What do you do? Cholelithiasis, what do you do? You do nothing. You leave it alone. The, the risk of cholecystitis post-op is pretty negligible. So you don't, you don't bother with the gallbladder. Uh, colonic cancers, what do you do when you have diagnosed them at the same time? You want to treat whatever's life-threatening first. So if, it's, if there's a bowel obstruction, bleeding, you treat that first and then come back and do the AAA. Nowadays with stent grafts, we can do a lot of these things in kind of a quick stage manner. But so these are more for historical purposes. Uh, intra-op, you get a lot of bleeding. We tend to transfuse one to one to one. Um, and hopefully you don't ever get into that. But you want to keep the body temperature up. They'll go into DIC very quickly if they come in cold and stay cold. All right, post-op, people do different things. I leave them on a ventilator overnight. That way I can kind of hydrate them with impunity. Uh, some people take the NG tube out right away. We tend to leave it in a day or two just so they don't vomit. Um, if they're not eating by day seven, that's really time to think about TPN. Uh, as opposed to a lot of our vascular patients, the aneurysm patients do get DVTs and PEs quite frequently. So you want to make sure, you know, a lot of the aortobifans, PVD people, they don't really get DVTs too often, but the aneurysm patients are different. So you have to treat them as such. So be careful uh, with PEs in them. And most open uh, series have a mortality about 3 to 5% in the 30 days. You do need to follow them. That used to be the whole thing we would say in the debate, ah, oh, the EVARs you got to follow all the time, and, and the open aneurysms, you, you just send them on their way. But they get other aneurysms. They do get graft complications. So I bring them in at least every year. They have to be reminded to get antibiotics prior to any dental procedure. It's probably a good idea with the EVARs, too. And you get a non-con CT every five years. Make sure they don't have any kind of pseudoaneurysm or other aneurysms growing or brewing. Uh, so what's this? Inflammatory, right? So you usually see kind of that light up of that rind, and that, that's pathognomonic for an inflammatory aneurysm. When you, I, I don't know where I found this on the internet. I just the drawing cracks me up. But the, the two things you got to watch for an inflammatory aneurysm are the duodenum and the ureters. So a lot of times we deal with these retroperitoneal. Now, thank goodness, we can treat them with EVARs, and most of the time that retroperitoneal fibrosis will go away just by diverting the blood from the aneurysm sac. Uh, what's that? Horseshoe, yeah. We used to get these as, before the days when everybody got CAT scans. We would get a surprise horseshoe kidney once in a while, and those are real fun. Um, 
So you, you won't be surprised by these anymore, but when you did, it was, it was interesting. So the problem with the horseshoe kidney, is not only that it's this giant thing that's in your way, it's the blood supply, especially if they have a well-formed isthmus, comes from the aorta itself. Um, rather than from the, the renal arteries per se. So you can't really mobilize it off the aorta without the risk of infarcting the, the isthmus of the horseshoe kidney. So retroperitoneal is kind of the way to go for them, but they're tough to deal with no matter what. If it's just an aorta by fem for occlusive disease, you do an end side uh, just above it and kind of sneak it around the, uh, the horseshoe kidney. Uh, and then there's a lot of venous uh, malformations, left-sided IVC, and then the, the retroaortic uh, renal vein, which was another fun surprise in the days before CAT scans when you clamp the aorta and all of a sudden there's venous bleeding coming from behind it. So nowadays you, you're going to see that on a CAT scan, but you always wanted to look for it. But that, you know, the most common um, configuration of, of a of venous an anomaly of the renal vein is that kind of um, circum aortic one. So, but you're going to see that on a CAT scan and know how to deal with that, but you just have to know it's there and avoid tearing it. And then ruptures, you just have to know that they look weird, right? So you get the, you get the typical retroperitoneal one. But if you see something like this, you know, don't think, oh, this is a well-contained laminated thrombus in the aorta. Anything that looks weird like this you, is a risk of rupture, and you have to kind of treat it as such. I've never seen either of these signs um, except on exams, so good luck to you. And then uh, I welcome you all to see my talk next year on conversational Latin and other fun topics. So thank you very much.